I am so grateful you decided to join us for our Bible study tonight. I bet you can't tell what the theme is for tonight's Bible study. Hmm. Well, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of this day on this week of Pentecost, our beginning of this great season. We pray that you bless us and be with us and open up the scripture to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, happy birthday! So to every Christian on the face of the planet, we celebrate the birthday of the Church of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. And so before we get into what Pentecost is, let me kind of break, a, break down this word, because Pentecost itself, it's a little bit, a little bit odd. What, what in the world is it? It's two words. Actually, it's two numbers. Five, Pentagon, you've heard of that. Five, and this is ten. Five times ten is what? Oh, it equals fifty. So it's 50 days, 50 days, hmm, after what? We celebrate our birthday for 50 days? Now, let me tell you how this works. So, Jesus Christ was, as we know, we celebrate his birth on Christmas. And there are a lot of Christians who believe that Christmas Day, oh, let's just live in the spirit of Christmas all of our lives. I don't want to live, I love Christmas, by the way. I love Christmas. It is a fantastic holiday. I love the church aspect of Christmas. It means everything to me. There's nothing more meaningful to me than going to church every uh, uh, on Christmas Day. I love starting the day that way. It's, it's powerful to me and powerful to spend that time with your family. But I don't want to live in the spirit of Christmas all the rest of my life because Christmas is a dead end, okay? It's just a baby boy born in Bethlehem who cares if it weren't for this next part, which is, of course, the death and resurrection of Christ. Okay? Ultimately, Easter. Without Easter, and of course with Easter I'm implying Good Friday and all the death and the resurrection aspect of it. This doesn't mean anything. Christmas is just another day. It's just an excuse to go buy toys for your kids, okay? However, the death and the resurrection is what ultimately brings God's plan to fruition in our lives. The salvation of God. That's what we've just been looking at. That's why we celebrate, you know, Christmas we celebrate for 12 days. Hmm, okay, fantastic. Easter we celebrate for 49 days. Oh, wait a minute, now you might be getting to the idea where this 50 comes from. 49 days. On the 40th day, after the resurrection, okay, we have a thing called ascension. On ascension day, that is the day that Christ was taken up to heaven to sit at the right hand, okay, of God. And so here we have the ascension, and now 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, which, by the way, was already a Jewish holiday, okay? It was already a Jewish holiday of, of the planting of the seeds and the harvest and big celebration, and people would come from all over to celebrate this holy day in Jerusalem. And so it was a day filled with people, and it was on this day that we celebrate the birth of the church, 50 days after the resurrection. So what are we celebrating? Well, I want you to keep a couple of people in mind here. In particular, this guy right here. Good old Pete. Peter. That's right. The Rock. All right. The original Rock. All right. Um, Peter, the Rock, the disciple of Jesus, who on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, vowed to Jesus that he would die with him if push came to shove. And then, this is meant to be somewhat ironic, a slave girl confronted Peter. This is the most powerless person in that society. She's got no teeth. She's got no power. She comes and accuses him of being a Galilean, one of Jesus' type. You've got to be a follower of him. What does Peter do? Oh, no, not me. I'm not a follower of Jesus. In fact, three times P 
Peter denies that. He's a coward. Oh, I'm not going to deny you, Jesus. Three times. And I've said this. I believe this to be true. I believe I can prove this. Peter is just as bad as this guy. Okay? Just as bad! And we throw all our indictment on this guy. The only difference between these two is that Peter the coward survived to see the resurrection. Judas did not. And so I find that always really sad because I think this guy could have been the greatest apostle of the church of Jesus Christ. He just lived to Easter Sunday and had an experience with the resurrected Christ and seen the full plan come to fruition. So at any rate, here's Peter denying Jesus. He's a coward, blah, 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 doesn't know what to do. You know, when it comes time... Um, <laughs> When, when Peter, in fact, what's kind of funny about it, when Peter f hears about the resurrection, do you know what he decides to do? He says, oh, let's go fishing. <laughs> okay. So that's your response to the resurrection. Oh, golly, Peter, Peter, Peter. All right. So we finally come to the birthday of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so, again, I want you to keep this guy. I'm going to erase all of that stuff. I want, to keep, want you to keep Peter in mind. Because something happens to that coward, Peter, and it happens on this day. So the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, they being the disciples. Now remember, there were more than 12 disciples. There were many, many, probably 100 disciples, 200 disciples, we don't know. So we go on. Suddenly, the heaven came like a sound of a rush of a violent wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. So I want to, this wind, okay? The wind, this is really important. You see oftentimes when God, when there's a revelation of God, it's oftentimes out of a, a, out of a thunder, out of the mighty wind, out of natural events that just seem to be out of place at that time in that place. God is making himself known in a powerful way. So we hear this shaking of this wind, okay? The shaking of the wind. Now, uh, this is important because back in the Old Testament, in particular Genesis 1, we are told that God breathed life. The wind, the pneuma, the spirit into our lungs. All right, so this was, in Genesis 1, creation. God breathed life into us. So what do you think is being represented by the wind here? God is going to bring, breathe new life. Oops, we are a new creation. Something brand new is happening. Remember, Peter the coward? God is giving him a new life. He's making him a new creation. That's what's being spoken by this mighty wind that is blowing through this place. So it filled the entire house. Divided tongues. Well, you know, I, I, I cannot even envision this. You know, there are a lot of artists' renditions of what this might look like, who knows? I, I have no clue. I have no clue what this might look like. But divided tongues as a fire appeared on them. So I don't know if it's the type of glow that was over them, whatever the case might be. And it rested on, a tongue rested on each one of them. And they were filled with Holy Spirit. Now this, we do know, is representative of this being that we call the Holy Spirit. Now, the, phrase, the word Holy Spirit, by the way, is you know, um, is grammatically a neuter term, okay? So it, it really, the Holy Spirit isn't a he. <laughs> the Holy Spirit isn't a she. The Holy Spirit is this power from God, but it's a being. It's, the, it's a part of God uh, that comes to us in some way. So, I, you know, but it's, it's, 
It's this power from God, this, this fire from God. Now you think about what fire does, and we think of just the destructive properties of fire. And that is true. Fire does destroy. But I want you to imagine, in California recently, we've had these brush fires over these last few years that destroyed properties, threatened lives, and everybody's like, ooh, we have to protect our homes and protect our people. But there's a reason why these fires have been out of control. And no, it's, it's, it's not global warming, okay? I, and I'm not trying to be political here. It's just not. Uh, those who study, again, uh, uh, our universe <coughs> and the natural properties of our universe <coughs> realize that the reason why there's so many fires and brush fires in California going on has to do with the fact that we have been stopping little brush fires from burning over the last 50 years because we want to protect all the properties and all the people. And now all of a sudden, Mother Nature, so to speak, is really having its way because there is all of this, um, this brush that's been not burned over the years that just keeps piling up on top of each other, on top of each other, when all of a sudden a little spark, bam, the whole thing goes up. Well, imagine if 50 years ago there was just a little brush fire. And then maybe a year later, another little brush fire. No big deal. But we've got years and years and years and years of sedimentation of, of this brush that has built up because we protected these properties from fires, and now it's going up all at one time. It seems like a bad thing because it's threatening our properties. But in little doses, if it had been able to do what it's supposed to do, what happens when the fires burn this brush? It nurtures the ground. It starts that life cycle, that process all over again. So you see, we think of fire just as destruction. But fire is a purification. It is a preparation for brand new life. So when the fire comes in our life, God isn't trying to kill us. God is trying to burn that brush out of our lives that's been built up over these years, these things that are not important, that are taking us away from a relationship with God and wants to burn that off, not kill us, burn it off. So, it's, so our hearts are prepared for that new life that God wants to plant into us, those new seeds. So this is what this Holy Spirit represents and why I think this imagery and why God communicates to us through this type of imagery, uh, who the Holy Spirit is. Now look at verse 4. All of the people gathered there were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, before we get to that second phrase, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we have some churches, some of our Pentecostal churches say, well, you need to ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. I didn't see the disciples asking for the filling of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you didn't ask right. Well, that's just not true. You're a Christian. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have been filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit. You may not know what that means. You may not be taking advantage of that gift. But trust me, you have that gift. Because of your relationship with Christ, it's your birthday after all. We celebrate the giving of the Holy Spirit. So you're filled with the Holy Spirit, just like the early disciples were. And now what did they do? They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit uh, gave them ability. And again, our, our Pentecostal friends will talk about the glossolalia and the, the speaking in tongues and this and that. Um, it's very clear here that the intention of this is that they were speaking known languages so that people could understand. They were inspired. How were they inspired to do this? Did they know some of these languages? Or were they led to speak in these languages? Whatever the reason might be, they were speaking all of these different languages and giving a testimony. Okay? They were giving a testimony to what God had done for them. We looked at a few testimonies over the last couple of weeks. It's very simple. 
man, my life was a mess. God got a hold of my life, gave me new life. There you go. That's a testimony. All right? It's not a bashing over somebody's head, the big theology, uh, the, the theological things that they need to believe in order to go to heaven. We just need a relationship with God. That's it. It's just my testimony of what God has done for me. And so they were inspired to do this. And so they're witnessing in all these different languages so that everybody understood. But there's a reason why this is mentioned. So the Spirit, they, gave, they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability because this is important. Why? Because God's concern is for everyone. Okay? Everyone. This is... God, God, what God is doing is, you remember, in, again, the Bible, there is a, uh, a story, the Tower of Babel, where the languages of people became confused. This is the anti-Babel story, okay? Where God is bringing people together. And yes, that's the intention of this lesson. This is the anti-Babel story. God is bringing people together again through Jesus Christ. See, in the past, in Babel, what they were, they were celebrating their own glory, being their own gods, and so God confused their languages. Now God is bringing them together under the one true God. This is the anti-Babel story, okay? Now, there were devout Jews from every nation living under... Uh, living in Jerusalem, and at this sound, the crowd gathered, and they were bewildered, because each of them heard them speaking their native language. They were amazed and astonished, and they said, are not all these people Galileans? Well, Galileans, by the way, are not dopes. You know, this is a very metropolitan area. People came in and out, and it's quite transient, so they, they heard Greek. They knew how to speak Greek. They probably... Um, knew many other languages, you know, not, uh, Ar obviously they spoke Aramaic, they didn't speak Hebrew. Hebrew at this point was nearly a dead language, but Aramaic and Greek, and they would speak uh, uh, the Latin, they would speak many different languages they heard being spunk spoken here. But how is it we hear each in our own language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pam Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belong to the C Cyrene and the visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Do you see how he's covering the entire world, at least the entire known world? Everybody is there because it's a big holiday. It's a bringing together of people from all over the world. And what the Spirit has done is gathered them all and is going to spread them out throughout the entire world. Because God's plan is everyone. Everyone is included in God's plan. Okay? All were amazed. They were perplexed. They said, what does this mean? But others still, I love this, others sneered and said, they're filled with new wine. <laughs> Okay, but Peter, standing at 11, raised his voice, the men of Judea uh, living here, let this be known, listen to what we say, indeed these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Oh, come on. Have you ever been to Vegas, Peter? Really? There's plenty of drunk people in Vegas at 9 in the morning. Don't know. But nevertheless, no, this is what was spoken to the prophet. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know. Who did I say you're supposed to pay attention to? Peter? What, what was he doing 50 days before? Powerless woman, the most disconnected person, a slave woman, accusing him of being a Galilean, a follower of Jesus, and he was a coward. Now Jerusalem is filled with tens of thousands of visitors from all over the world. Fifty days after, what happened to Peter? Now here he is standing up in front of them with great courage and giving a testimony to his faith. What changed Peter? Well, obviously, an experience with the resurrected Christ. But then on top of that, the giving of this Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the giver of courage. The Spirit gives us new life. The old Peter was a coward. The new life that God has given him 
gives him courage. This is a great lesson. I hope you're enjoying this. We're almost done, but just one or two more things. No, this is what the prophet has spoken through Joel, Peter went on to say. In the last days it will be, God declares that I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Stop for a minute. I want you to hear this again because you're hearing this with a, you know, uh, with a contemporary mindset and not understanding how profound this is. In the beginning, when God created male and female, male and female created in the image of God, but there's these greedy men who wanted power, and so they didn't let women share in that power that God had given to them. They oppressed women. That's what Genesis 3, by the way, is all about. Man takes advantage of his position, his prowess, and oppresses woman. That's called sin. But this condition existed for thousands of years where women were put under the thumb of men. And then there came along this guy named Jesus. Jesus has women disciples. Now, they were not the inner circle, the twelve, because that would have been really inappropriate for Jesus to have been traveling in the wilderness with, surrounded by twelve women. Can you imagine what would have been said? The eyebrows that would have been raised. So it's not that Jesus didn't think they were capable. In fact, the very first witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the ambassador to the ambassadors, the apostle to the apostles, was a woman named Mary Magdalene because Jesus chose her. This is really an important theme that we keep hearing, that when we say that the gospel is for everyone, yes, that includes that powerless slave girl and God's kingdom, is equal to the mighty king. Now maybe in the world, she doesn't have much power. But in God's kingdom, she is everything. And so are these women. This is, what, this is the point of this. In the last days it will be, God declares, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters. Not just your sons, your daughters too, because God is now opening up the kingdom to everyone the way it's supposed to be. All right, they'll see visions. And they'll dream dreams. And even on slaves, remember, who is Peter afraid of? <laughs> Both men and women in those days I'll pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. We're all equal now. God has made, given us courage, given us new life. Okay? Through the Holy Spirit. It's our birthday. It's a brand new day. I will show portents in heaven, signs on earth below, blood and fire, smoky mist. Oh, that's a, ooh. <laughs> Remember again, California, burning away the trash. Okay, so that the ground is plant is prepared to receive the seed that God wants to place in us. That does sound spooky, but again, it's also a reminder of 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 the temple. Whenever the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, they were completely blind back there. It was filled with smoke and mist and something magical, amazing was happening back in their perspective in the Holy of Holies. Okay? So that's the imagery that we're supposed to think of. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great, great Lord's great and glorious day. And this is, this is so important. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now... I also want you to point out that it doesn't say the corollary to that. It doesn't say those who don't call on the name of the Lord will be sent to hell. See, there are some Christians that's all they want to seem to talk about is how you're going to hell. That is so rarely mentioned about the only people that Jesus ever condemns. Well, not just about. The only people that Jesus ever condemns and says will not have a place in the kingdom of heaven are scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders. He never says the common people, not the common Joe, okay, not the common Sue. Um, I want you to understand that God's intention in life is to bring everyone into God's kingdom. <gasps> That's universalism. Well, you know what? God is a universalist. God wants to bring everybody into the kingdom. There are people who by their choices, because they're religious leaders and they're people who are fanatical about protecting their position and power, who will reject the gift of God. And they won't have a place in the kingdom. 
However, everyone else, God is relentless and will pursue and pursue and pursue them. What do you think the resurrection is all about? It is about the relentlessness of God's love that not even death itself could keep you from God. I hope, now let me just read this one more time, that last verse. I want to leave you with this. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's no ritual that you have to go through. No um, regulations that you have to follow. It doesn't say you have to believe a certain systematic theology. You just call upon the name of God. God, I, I need you in my life. Guess what? Then it becomes your birthday. Your new birthday. The Spirit fills us, gives us courage, helps us through this life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this anti-Babylon story. The bringing together of all the peoples of the world so that they might hear about Jesus, because your intention is bigger and broader than we, even the church, have imagined. We seem to want to limit it to certain groups of people. You want to open it up to everyone. And so we thank you for your relentlessness. We thank you, God, that you just continue to pursue the people of this world. Why do you think this world goes on? Because you're relentless. You don't give up. You are always filled with hope for this world and its potential and the potential of people to come to relationship with you. And so God help us to have that same energy and excitement about this world as well. Because you've called us not only just to have new life for our own purposes, but to take that new life and be a blessing to others. So send us forth into this world as your ambassadors, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May God's blessing be upon you and send you forth in peace in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Happy birthday. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. You are a new creation. God is doing something incredible in you. Amen.